Okay, Larry. Okay. <laughs> so uh, he's the <laughs> biggest student of them all. <laughs> right, right. He really sucks. Yeah, I have a question. I, I think it's mostly for Jeff, but also maybe for Jennifer. So it has to do with the accenting and. Um, so there's, there's, there are a lot of studies uh, dealing with um, anaphoric de-stressing where the cues are linguistic, clearly, and those are easy to, or relatively easy to manipulate, um, and the data we get is surprising often. But what I was wondering about is um, uh, pragmatically controlled uh, cases of the accepting where the pragmatics is extra linguistic so minimal pair um, uh, I'm, I, I call you and I say I thought you were coming uh, versus I go up to you at the party and say I thought you were coming where the opposite patterns don't really seem to work intuitively. Now I've learned this morning that I can't trust my linguist intuitions, but it's a strong intuition. Or, uh, or uh, your, your intuitions are old. I, I share your intuitions when I'm imagining something in my head. My intuitions are very often quite clear. Yeah, very robust. And if I say them aloud, <laughs> the person next to me will go, "Yeah, that's English. That well, that sounds great." It's just we test them. Yeah. Yeah. So it just another example of the same kind of thing. Uh, you know, uh, uh, what, is, what is it like to be uh, a Trump supporter uh, said by, um, uh, say, an interviewer to someone at a, uh, a rally to someone wearing a MAGA hat versus one MSNBC host to another one? What is it like to be a Trump supporter in the light of these revelations? So, uh, you know, where the, the context provides the, the quasi-anaphoric uh, material for the subsequent de-stressing. So have those been studied, and what did they reveal about people uh, you know, in situ as opposed to in vacuo uh, and those kinds of things? Sure. Um, I don't have any satisfying answer. I don't know. That's actually um, exactly where I was hoping my project would go, I think. So, like I mentioned during my talk, I wasn't a sound person before, but I kind of just got onto this, um, sort of because of questions of context. So I was really interested in like what kind of information can you manipulate totally outside of language that might affect what sorts of you know contours, let's say, are felicitous. Mm -hmm. Um, and naively, I thought that I was starting with a really simple case by doing these like entailment examples, and that there would be this great effect, and then I would build from there and move into like, now I'm going to manipulate context, but the effect didn't exist at all here. Um, but at the same time, yeah, people have pretty, I mean, at least among linguists, robust intuitions that this kind of contextual support does work. Um, so they're almost, to me, this is totally impressionistic, but seems to be maybe a bit of a paradox uh, where things that are less formally inferable but sort of more in informally, pragmatically inferable seem to support this de-accenting more. So when I've given this talk before and someone wants to come up to me and talk about the Republican insult example mm -hmm. and insist how great it is, and I don't dispute that, they say the makeoff example. Like, yeah, so you got the, the dates, you know, yes. back in the '69, '82, '81, yeah. earlier. Oh yeah. Um, '69. Yeah. People say it works because they're so distinct from each other, mm. and that you're it's sort of some kind of trigger telling you you really need to go into your world knowledge to deal with this, and not just look at this lexical relationship. <laughs> So I don't have an intelligent response, maybe. Maybe Jennifer has something better to say. But yeah, there seems to be this sort of mystery there that I'm aware of, but I don't yeah. know. I think the Republican case, because it does deal with world knowledge, is different from I thought you were coming. And so it's not kind of common ground, general common ground material, but it is contextual in that, in that particular, whether we call it a pragmatic presupposition. Or, you know. I think that um, it's, so when we want to ask questions about uh, and for de-accenting, um, we need to be careful that we're not in, um, we're looking at that alone and not interacting with contrasted focus. So the way that you offered your examples, you had contrasted focus on thought. You said, I thought you were coming. 
Well, I, I, I was trying, it, it wasn't so much accenting thought as de-accenting everything well, that follows, but putting put, nuclear stress to put, on thought. To put, but the way that you said it, the way I heard oh, okay. it, I heard, <laughs> uh, I heard a contrastive focus marking accent on thought, which made me think that you're contrasting thought with said or imagined. No, I, I didn't but, intend that. But, that but that's what I heard. But yeah. <laughs> and, and it, well, if you have to focus on thought, you have to de-accent what comes out. Exactly. After it. Right. So, so the de-accenting of a verb might sometimes be intended through amphoric de-accenting, but at other times it might be coming about due to uh, the obligatoriness of de-accenting following the focus. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, and these are hard to, to tease apart. Mm -hmm. They're actually mm -hmm. really hard to tease apart. Um, but a, a more general answer is that there are people that are working on um, there are some uh, people working on the rich sort of pragmatic and segmented conditions that license de-accenting in Germany. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> now I understand like why you did because German has much more uh, systematic de-accenting mm -hmm. phenomena than English does. But um, I'm thinking of our research that in Baumann and Easter from Stuttgart and Stefan Baumann from Cologne, so, uh, looking at uh, uh, a more, more taking a deeper dive into the context. And also they've got like this gigantic hierarchy of, um, of semantic relations and pragmatic contexts that license de-accenting to different degrees and the different kinds. So they've got a theory called reflex, but referential and lexical givenness where, uh, where they they try to work this out, and they've applied it to corpus material, but it's, mm -hmm. I have not been able to replicate a lot of that. Okay. What, what, what I was, uh, just if I, could, if I could jump in just on this on this point, kind of like relating it back to, to Herb's talk on Thursday, I was wondering, um, so, so this kind of, um, with the anaphoric the accent thing, you're trying to get um, the context from lexical items as opposed to the broader context in which people are embedded. And I wonder if you got that, um, if you would get more, if you would get some <laughs> anaphoric the accent thing, um, uh, if if the um, uh, if the information about the relatedness came not from the lexical item, uh, which there's a massive space of things associated with lexical items, but came from the particular context in which um, uh, the interlocutors are embedded. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I I agree with the intuition definitely. Uh, I mean. I guess the intuition is that de-accenting and verbal material is some kind of like discourse move, right? You're trying to maybe guide your listener into realizing that there's this maybe dependency between these two lexical items or something. Um, with that in mind, it's not surprising maybe that in my production study, then people don't do this because they don't really know any particular goal that they should have in mind to communicate to the listener, right? Um, it's not clear that in the context that they might be saying this sentence in the real world, that's an interesting thing to do. Um, well, we, we controlled that in our study. Yeah. So we had, like, we were actually specific about what the semantic uh, relations were that would license that. So you mean study four, right? The, um, the, the gen machine? No. No, which study? Uh, the production study that oh, I talked about yeah. very first, the, just the production study. Um, and we always had a situational context. The first sentence established the situation is something happened in the restaurant or the kitchen or baking or cooking, and and that was contributed to the to the anaphoric de accenting in with the addition of a lexically. So you have to you have to I agree that you need to separate out the lexically licensed for, uh, with where you get these lexical semantic relations and hypernomy and hyponymy that that in are uh, involved or part whole relations from the pragmatic sort of situational context. They contribute differently. I'm not sure which one is stronger with these though. I'm not sure. And I should say probably that we took the exact opposite approach. So in our carrier phrases, we intentionally stripped any helpful information away from the sentence that came before our critical one because we didn't want the context to affect the relationship, the lexical relationship I said between the two years. But it didn't help us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, follow up? Yeah. I, I was wondering, so if... It, 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 it's okay, There's, I saw many hands at once. Because so, so, oh, yeah. 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 Yes, I know, but then you interrupt me and I have to go to the <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay. 
um, so um, people can accommodate whether people make a high pitch, have a high range of pitch or a low range of pitch, right? So I was wondering, so the only, in this very unnoisy, very easy settings, we tested these people in, obviously. So I'm wondering if there's, maybe it's easier when there's a person that has a high pitch range, when you can, uh, we, as, we, as we know, as we all talk in this room, it's loud and we have to accommodate to everyone too. So would you expect that people, that I could understand a person that who has a high range in, in a not so ideal environment than a person with a low range because uh, I could extract information better? I think that, that that's a straightforward prediction. If someone is louder and using, um, and, and, and with bigger, uh, swifter pitch modulations than the, just at an auditory level, mm -hmm. if we're going to have a stronger response to that, and so have a greater likelihood of um, noticing it, maybe interpreting it. Um, I imagine that there's accommodation to the setting though, the auditory context uh, as well. So if we're going to whisper, you know, about mm -hmm. the, la the last question. Uh, I'm going to require very a very low threshold for what it takes to be a uh, problem. Mm -hmm. Nick, did you want to uh, add on to that? So you were saying at the beginning of your talk, you're talking about you had this different this list of things that could contribute redundancy, yeah. and although you ended up modeling duration, yeah. um, you <coughs> had this other list which included f zero, yeah. and I, I was like, I wonder. Yeah, I mean, even with duration, probably. I mean, it makes sense, but is, do we really know that um, if you make a word longer, it's more likely to be Recognize it seems reasonable, but mm -hmm. suppose um, it seems it makes sense. We know that for a fact. Uh, it's an interesting uh, question. The only thing I can say about it is uh, not recognition per se, but uh, I have a pilot study now looking at corpus data for child language acquisition, mm -hmm. where I'm looking at the input, mm -hmm. and uh, I measured two things. Uh, the average duration, so you had the mean duration of individual lexical items, um, factoring out all of the other stuff that comes with that, like the number of vowels, for example, and the length segmentally and so on. Uh, but then looking uh, additionally at the standard deviation of these durations. Mm -hmm. And so what, which of these is actually more important to, to the acquisition? Uh, so how do you correlate it with uh, the age of earliest production? in different ways, and indeed uh, the mean duration means nothing, and the deviation tells you everything. So it's actually how different you experience the word that helps you to know it. And uh, in terms of the talk we saw from Chigasa, this yeah. is um, uh, us dealing with variability seems to be the thing that helps us to learn uh, lexical items in particular the best. Uh, and we're quite good at it, and we're even good on it on sh extremely short time scales. Uh, and what's the interpretation? How do you interpret that? Uh, well, there's lots of literature on discrimination learning and things like this that suggest that when you have variability around a common core, that uh, this is actually what allows you to discriminate meanings the best. So if you have, uh, for example, more variable uh, syntactic environments around the lexical item, the item will be learned earlier because there's some eye of the storm, right? So and the idea is that the, the variation in duration is, is, is actually the result of that other more meaningful variation. I mean, I have, no, in, I, in this case, why in they vary, I don't know. <laughs> so, but uh, what I do know is that where the variation is most uh, heavily present, uh, that is precisely the situation where the child uh, is, is able to latch on to the word. Yeah. Because basically the child is going to have to vary their uh, uh, articulation of the word for lots of other reasons themselves. And they will hear it with full vowels, with truncated vowels, with all of this kind of stuff. And when they get all of these different representations with the same intended meaning underneath it, that's the core, right? Then they have 
they at least it appears feel more comfortable producing it at an earlier age. Mm -hmm. uh, variation and abstraction. Oh no, 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 sorry. Oh, no, 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 it's on the topic of duration. So when I showed my data in adult production, duration doesn't seem to do anything in terms of the differentiation of question versus statements. Mm -hmm. But uh, that doesn't mean that duration is never important. Uh, there's this developmental study looking at four-year-olds, and it's really difficult for young children to control their pitch precisely. Mm -hmm. So their questions and the statements are not that different in terms of pitch, but they try to use duration to indicate mm -hmm. one meaning. So in that, and then if you're adapting to that type of speak speaker, you might learn that, okay, it's not the pitch, it's the duration that I need to keep track of. So I don't think there's one set of cues that are always important. You can always adjust mm -hmm. your mapping. Um, we had a question back there. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I had a question, I had a clarifying question about the gumball experiment, and then based on that, I have like a more real question. So the speakers were never told whether they were, or sorry, the listeners were never told whether they were correct when they picked. They just knew based on the intonation. We were just um, hoping that they would use their uh, familiarity with English and that they had already a mapping. We were testing really whether they already had a mapping from their knowledge of English between certain intonation contours and and meaning along, we tested two different dimensions of meaning. Yeah, so I was wondering um, why you think the data mapped so well onto the prediction when other experiments that try to tie intonation to meaning have failed. Like, what, why do you think this one came with such a nice result? Um, that's a good question. I think in, in part the other studies that have, that have tested, and including ours, that have tested per, uh, interpretation of intonation have zoomed in and fo have, have focused more on fo focus conditions and new information, old information, and making distinctions there. And I think that the difficulty is that there's a lot of accommodation to pragmatic context that makes that interpretation, that mapping between the signal and the meaning um, less direct and less uh, transparent to, to modeling. Um, in our, I think we just had a much tighter closed system. There wasn't any other pragmatic, you know, there wasn't any, any kind of a other context beyond this in a very simple universe that we created of getting a prize from a machine. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe maybe for that reason we weren't asking about focus like mm -hmm. is it the subject or the object that's you know or is it broad focus or narrow we were just really looking at the likelihood that they're going to answer uh, among three mm -hmm. answers so yeah uh, yeah so across the talks I see uh, a lot of individual variation plays so around here and I'm just wondering if I don't study a lot of, about sound, but I'm wondering whether the individual difference is coming from. Like, where does that come from? Is it coming from some people are just better at doing this mapping between sound and intonation, or some people are just better at integrating information or identifying the signal that is crucial in the context? Mm -hmm. So there are many <coughs> possible dimensions that contribute uh, to this individual variation, and I'm just wondering, what do you, what are your observations come from the intonation setting? Yes, all of that. I mean, we, I, in my lab, I actually looked at individual differences in listeners' perception of prominence divorced from meaning. Just like listen to this speech and click on every word that you hear as prominent, whatever that means to you, and then tr and then model those responses in relation to lexical information, syntactic information, predictive like word frequency, acoustic measures. And with respect to the acoustic measures alone, there were individual differences. There were there were people who were like taking into account all the acoustic cues that we that we measured, whose responses were well predicted by all of them. There were there were other listeners and there were like three groups, other listeners who were really just tracking F zero. And duration uh, um, differences were not didn't play into their response. And then there were listeners who tracked duration and didn't pay attention to it zero. It's hard to know how much that's related to the particular weird task of you know picking on words you hear as prominent, but it did reveal that when you hold the task common, people really 
uh, show different sensitivities um, in their auditory as well, in their perceptual response. So to different kinds of signals. To the different dimensions of the signal, which is equally present for everybody. So, sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yes. yes. Uh, did you guess uh, then if do they have intuitions about that they they are re for, relying specifically on pitch? Uh, I didn't guess. Uh, because I bet they, it could be tested. Might be. But I don't think that that's the only source of the variation. I think no, there no. are also differences in people's tolerance. Some people will accept, like when we were playing your examples of the mm -hmm. signals that were supposed to be ambiguous between questions and statements, they weren't ambiguous at all for me. Mm -hmm. They were they were just questions <laughs> and I was like, does that did she play the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there yeah. are there are just 75, 25 is a pretty good Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I know. But there are yeah. differences in individuals' tolerances. Like what I consider my tolerance for up talk might be different than someone else's and that might affect my likelihood to guess me as a question. So I now have four experts here that I can ask a question that I've wanted to ask for 40 years here. <laughs> but it, it, it actually um, backs up what you guys are, are arguing. If you just look at the content of the sentences that are uttered, in almost every case you know what's given, what's new, uh, what is um, presupposed, and what you, can, uh, what you would have as, um, as anaphoric um, a new anaphor that we already know about. Uh, now, of course, this is just true when you read anything in print. Now, in print, um, one of the oldest ideas of how you read in print is actually you're transcribing this or you're trans uh, what, transforming it into some kind of acoustic signal and understanding the acoustic signal. So this is the claim that people are doing when they're reading Harry Potter or anything like this. But there's no intonation ever that's written into um, the written text. Well, so we're getting it. Pardon me? There's a question. There's a punctuation. Oh, there's, there are a few. Okay. Question mark is one of them. But, but that doesn't tell you whether that's you have, that you, you drop or rise intonation at the end. And there are occasional cases of emphasis. But in general, you can read a whole novel without reading anything that has to do with intonation. But we somehow are doing all the pragmatic work that, that, needs, that we need to do. So what do you do with this contrast between written stuff and the spoken stuff, where the written stuff has none of the stuff that you're interested in in it? Or, or is that true? I mean, you read a transcript of a, of a conversation uh, and, and you're just reading just the, actually what people said line by line. Yeah. It's actually rather difficult to extract even close to the same meaning that you get when you hear. But authors know how to do this. Well, that's because they're uh, they're writing. No, what do they do? I bet in court transcripts, it's no, also so. very hard to figure out what was going on because yeah. they don't have a system. They don't even use italics. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, exactly. if you were if you were Gail Jefferson doing a transcription, I don't know if you've ever seen a Jefferson transcription, mm -hmm. but it's got all kinds of accents yeah. and mm -hmm. pausing in it. But that's not the way writers write, at least in English. You can't so, writers up here, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and as we a, understand as a what's going to do from all of this stuff yeah. without any, just looking at the content of the sentences printed. So uh, does this help account for the fact that we don't have to know the intonation to know what's given the new, what's presupposed, that kind of stuff, in your utterances? It's redundant. I mean, the, the, a lot of information coming in. That's, that's, that's the other way to say it, mm -hmm. um, which is what Lester was pointing out. Um, this, there's this huge redundancy. It's a facilitating function, I think. Yeah, so then my next uh, impression is, suppose you wanted to do surprise. Now, surprise is to emphasize exactly. So if I were to do a surprise question, you're coming? You, you like him? He's the person you like. I mean, I do. I, all of these things are ways of ex making you use intonation in a way that's really productive. But surprise is not there in every sentence that you utter, typically. Is it? Is it? <laughs> but what you mentioned as attention is, in some sense, surprise. What's surprising to the interlocutor? 
Right. So yeah. like, well, as long as yeah. I'm conveying yeah. such information, it doesn't have to be yeah. like information in terms of given because it's new. And the fact that we're talking at all mm. means there's something that, that, that I think you don't know or want to bring into your awareness, otherwise I wouldn't bother to say anything. Mm. <laughs> Uh, perhaps there's a way to actually evaluate your question more directly. So uh, you now have these audio books that are coming out with mm -hmm. somebody reading the book. Yeah. And in many cases you have many different people reading the same text. Ah. So you can go in there and you can see, is there a remarkable consistency to the way that they're interpreting uh, the underlying intonation? Mm -hmm. Or uh, do different people take different steps? Also you might look at uh, actors uh, reading a script. Uh, people have done this. Yeah, so. Radio news announcers are, yeah. are actually trained to uh, map punctuation onto certain uh, informational qualities. And the, the training is different in Spanish. It sounds really different than in English, but it's systematic within each language. You could look at, there was a study done back decades ago on the Boston University Radio News Corpus. Mm -hmm. and they had five different trained NPR news announcers come into the lab and read the same news stories they were already familiar with, and then they looked at the intonation of each one, and they're not the same. <laughs> and they, but these are professional readers. Yeah. These are professional intoners. So we're getting, <laughs> we're getting the pragmatics from the content of what's said. There's more than one meaning yeah. that you can associate with. So I'll, I, I, just to follow up on that, on the uh, listening to audiobooks. I was listening to audiobooks for quotations. And readers, uh, the these whatever you call these people that do audiobooks. Narrators. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Narrators um, um, really do make use of uh, quotation. They they put on a different uh, intonation with quotation as they should. Um, all of the talk that I gave a couple days ago, but they also do on free indirect discourse. They do the same uh, pragmatic, so uh, dramatic uh, intonation contours mm -hmm. on in free indirect discourse. Now, I don't know that that's predicted by any of you guys, but still, that happens. So what a, what a guy she met. Now, this is not a quotation, but it's free indirect discourse in a narration and it's, it's done as if it were a quotation. Right. Yeah, so, so this is in connection to uh, uh, Jennifer, to the paper you cited, Watson, Arnold, and Tannenhaus. Yeah. And I forget exactly the example, but uh, you know, you were, this is about cases that are harder. You said that like, what I have in my notes is more harder. <laughs> and then, so you say that hard, you, know, you, you talked about easy cases and then harder cases. Uh, and my question was, and it's actually a question for all four of you, is what if we were to consider that there is nothing in the signal? In, a, in other words, so you, 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 you identify this, you know, there, there is something, but it's not, it's, not, it's not what we, it's not the grammatical thing, it's just a space. And we as the listeners are extracting in the la from the larger context and imposing this system. I think we had a demonstration of that in my exchange with Larry. Mm -hmm. I said, I heard Canessa focus. I didn't have yeah, to trust him focus then. Sorry, that's what I got from it. So yeah, I'm, he's using the space in one way to transmit some message, and then I'm using the same space, the same signal, but I get to use it, you know, I'm using it. And it's amazing that we succeed at ever. <laughs> 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 Are you sure you're succeeding? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a question. What's the met? What's the that's it. But then, if that's the case, then so because from my in the way that I understand, <coughs> anything has to do with intonation, which is you know I know very little about it. But any, it's everything is in the signal. Everything is in the grammar, right? And then it, 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 from the perspective of the production, so what is being said, it's there, and you just have to decode it. But what you are saying is, but if if what you are saying is true. It's not there, and and then we are getting it from some somewhere else. Yet we are this somewhere else is is is, is also a, a sound information, is phone phone information that we are imposing on it. But so not even for what does the does grammar look like that has that? So it's not all coming from the grammar from the speaker because there are psychosocial factors that contribute, 
I think we showed that in our production today. You just ask them to be lively, and they do it consistently, but they're going to do give the same message in a different way. So, and then you know the way I'm, yeah. So there's psychosocial factors that contribute at least as much as the sort of semantic pragmatic factors that have been received most of the attention. Mm. Um, and it's all mixed into the same signal. So when That's when right. Larry says his sentence, and I hear contrastive focus on the verb. And he didn't intend that. He intended something else. But and maybe it was, you know, I don't know. It could have been not non-linguistic factor that mm -hmm. caused him to to say it that way. But I still, you know, you're just guessing at what mm -hmm. the person means based on your past experience. Plus, I was emphasizing it to make the point, to, to make the contrast. Yeah. So that yeah. emphasis itself probably distorted. And the, that was the discourse the context, right? right. Mm -hmm. And whether I was intending to that or not. Yeah. Yeah. But the interaction itself allows for repair. I mean, just yes. to the point of how do we ever do it? We probably fail more often than we think, but we have such naturalized systems for repairing uh, misinterpretations Absolutely. of things like and intonation. That and gestures. It's, it mm -hmm. takes one turn, one eyebrow raise. Oh, that was a question. I can now respond to it or yeah. whatever. But to the extent that we can talk about variability, we're talking about a distribution, which means that there is something there that we are all converging into. Mm -hmm. So so, mm -hmm. that, so that's why I call grammar. I'm not saying you know yeah. something more than I'm saying grammar in a with capital G, yeah. uh, understood. Yeah. Because this is, is dream, reminiscent of what uh, Brita and Iran were talking about yesterday about these meta, you know, schemas of transaction. Right. So there are, I think there are a lot of factors that contribute to shaping the signal for the speaker. Yeah. And we we are we are beginning to understand what those factors are and what each one contributes. Individual speakers, the pragmatic context, the salience of that, and semantic relations, and so on. And in a perfect world. If we could quantify, if we could like, line up all those factors and then assign weights to all of them, and we should be able to predict the outcome of a given utterance on a given day by a given person. Yeah. I, I believe that, that that that's possible. You know, mm -hmm. maybe, but uh, I mean, there's only a little randomness in there. But um, yeah. but otherwise, mm -hmm. it wouldn't function in a, in a, as a communication system. It wouldn't serve our social needs. Yeah. I mean, it's like holding physics to the task of, of predicting the exact trajectory of a leaf. Yeah. So it's deterministic in yes. the end, but we're never going to be no. able to do it. And science shouldn't even attempt to do it. Well, but we still want to understand gravity. We still want to Wait, understand yes. gravity. Yes, yes. But we need to right, make the right idealizations that we can actually study. You want your idealization, though, to to model the data, the world of as course, you experience. Of course, of course, of course. So we're not going to get to a hundred percent, but like right now, we're maybe at five to ten percent. We can we can we can go a lot further. Yeah. But physics has done really well without getting to a hundred percent of doing. Uh, uh, so surely we don't want to be able to predict what anybody says at any moment. Well, surely that can't be our goal. Uh, well, no, it that's not what she's talking about. But we don't have to assume that. There's systematicity. Yeah. yeah. There's absolutely systematicity. Of course. Yeah. We're, we're coming close to the next block of, of talks. There's some twitching in the back that I did not want to ignore. Do you want to ask one more question? Um, well, I have one question that I wanted to ask, but I also thought about what was just there. I, I mean, I think uh, we do have to Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, greater variation in the context 
Well, it's, it's a difficult question. So in, in terms of uh, consistent frames, uh, there's a lot of research on what are called the frequent frames, where, so Tobin Mintz and these people, where you have uh, consistent uh, discontinuous uh, items, so I blank you, and then you have a whole slew of uh, different words mm -hmm. that can occur in there with different relative frequencies, yeah? And so this variability within that unit, uh, this slot, the, it's the variability that actually allows you to, con to bootstrap the, uh, the grammatical category of the words that tend to appear here. So again there, even when there's consistency and some sort of chunk, albeit a discontinuous chunk, it's the variability inversely construed in this case that allows for the learning of categories. Now, in the chunk-based learning, uh, this uh, could be just a complementary pattern, right? Because a chunk doesn't give you the word, it gives you a stock unit. And now when you get several s such stock units that overlap uh, with one another in different ways, this is where what I'm talking about comes into play. So short scale, uh, syntactically constrained relationships that may be more or less frequent in different certain syntagmatic chunks or whatever, but there's going to be variability uh, among these chunks. And the relative frequencies are what are going to drive some acquisition of individual items within those chunks. So yes, we learn the chunks, and perhaps we learn through learning chunks to get this discriminative learning of individual items out of, out of those chunks, because they ultimately must come out, right? <laughs> They, they can't stay in the chunk. We're, we're, we're not all talking. Time, right? uh, this is under dispute. Shoot, no, this is, uh, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say kids only talk in chunks because they also do lots of novel things and stuff that they've never heard. I mean, there's tons of evidence on the, on the contrary side. So I, I'm not taking a side, but I would say uh, don't, don't put all of your eggs in the chunk basket. <laughs> <laughs>